Uh, hello, everybody, and welcome to a special, they're all special these days, but a special live with Chuck Cassidy. I'm your host, Chuck Cassidy, and welcome to my humble abode, which is also my humble shop here in Denver, Colorado. Today, we have a real trial lined up for you, and I couldn't be more excited. Um, before we get too far, let's go over what is in store for us this evening. We're gonna be starting with our welcome, and we already did that, so we can cross that off. That feels good, doesn't it? Am I right? The next thing coming up, we've got a really special guest on our show. It's a channel and a couple and two people that I really love who are great humans but talented builders. We've got Kels and Jay coming on. And then after a little showcase of a sneak peek at their latest creation, I'm gonna get into the top roof raise considerations that you should know if you're considering doing something like that. And that's on my mind because if you'll look right here, we just started popping the top on this 2002 Thomas school bus. And I thought, hey, while it's fresh on my mind, let me show you some things that are important to me when we're doing a roof raise. And that's gonna segue just seamlessly into the tool du jour of the week. And you're gonna love that. And then we're gonna break it off as we always do for the third half of our show into a live Q&A moderated by the great Ben Jackson and Matt Evers, who are my live studio audience here in the shop with us today. It's great to have you guys in the shop. Yeah, we just were working on this roof raise today and we really got far. So without further ado, uh, and we could ado, I want to introduce to you the great Kels and Jay, and I'm gonna go ahead and bring them out of the guest room Kels and Jay, looks like we maybe just have Jay and Kels, and there we are. We got Kels and Jay live with us in the studio. It's so great to have the both of you here. It's been a long time since I've seen you, I feel like, even though it's maybe only been a month. How are you guys doing? A month's a too, month's long. too long. It's been too many years, it feels like. <laughs> it is an honor to be on the show. Awesome. Well, it's great to see you guys, and uh, I couldn't be more thrilled to have you here. Um, before we get too far into this, I wanna talk about why I've got the two of you on my channel, and that's because you guys have just finished your most recent project, which is right behind you, this lovely van conversion. And anybody out there knows I'm not a van guy, but <laughs> I'm okay with Kels and Jay because awesome. I secretly might be, but Kels and Jay are definitely bus people. They, you got your start, oh, you know, awesome. doing the bus thing. Yeah. And um, they just finished this project. And <laughs> there's like another van. Like just hide, just hide. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I met Kels and Jay for the first time competing on the television show Gutted, which at this point I've already talked about a lot. And we just had a blast working together and got a chance to see just the quality work that they do as a team. And it's amazing. And they just finished this van, and I want to share that with everybody. Um, it's for sale, apparently, and you could be one of the first people to have interest in it. If I think we, you guys can tell us where we can find the classified listing and maybe how to get in touch with you best. But I want to show everybody at home the quality work that you guys do. It's awesome. So Hell tell us yeah. about this van. <laughs> um, let's spin around, and we can kind of we can kind of walk through it a little bit. All right, that sounds great. Yeah, thank you, Chuck. I appreciate the kind words, yeah, too. It means a lot coming from... Say, what an intro. I mean, it's God great to have you us. here. It's just great to be here, isn't it? <laughs> it really is. It was like, during Gutted, we'd be like, these are the best days of our lives. It's great to, it's just great to be here. <laughs> Leave it all on the field. <laughs> all right, let me take you up here. Okay, we're going live into the van. We're I'm going to spin the this round. Working? Uh, you, I think it just went control? dark. Uh-oh. <laughs> That's not good. Yeah. How about now? That's working. That's good. There we go. <coughs> All right, Kelsey, lead the way. All right, come on in, guys. So this is actually our first official tour. We haven't done a tour yet of this van. We've oh, my God. It's a premiere. One today, and we'll be posting it Sunday, but you guys get the first real tour. Well, that's exciting. Um, so when you first walk in here, we just have two seats over here. Lots of room for activities. We have a game out. If you guys don't know this game, this is our favorite game, Bonanza. 
Be put, it, put it in the chat if you've played Bonanza. That this thing, is yeah. such a good game. You can beat it for hours. Hours. Us <laughs> and the High Drive bus, we would play this for like five hours every night when we were with them. It's a kill game. Um, yeah, come on in. You want to you spin around this way. <laughs> <laughs> we have prepared. We're not prepared. <laughs> um, over so we have three drawers here. Ample room for storage. We have storage under here as well and in the couch. Um, vans aren't like buses. You have to make the most of every single square inch of this space. And that's kind of what we learned going from a bus build to a van build. We are like, it's like a puzzle. So it's, it is like Legos in a way, Chuck. Um, but like yeah. a, little bit, a little bit harder than Legos, I'd say. <laughs> Advanced Legos. <laughs> Um, and then if you come in here, we have a Dometic fridge. Love, I don't know how you guys feel about Dometic, but I love Dometic products. We have Dometic stovetop. And then an AC, which is pretty nice. Dometic AC over here. We have a nice shower. Talk to and me about that shower yeah. tile design. Yeah. And What's going the grout on there? It's pretty nice, Chuck. I think you'd be pretty impressed with, with the grout. Did you cut those tiles to that shape yourself? No, they. <laughs> yeah, we we milled. I got really good on the tile cutter. We milled every <laughs> single tile in house. Handmade them. No, this I is wouldn't just be surprised. Tile. And, then, and then we have laminate uh, sheets on either side. We have a Dometic toilet, never been used. Nice, Jamie, fresh. I, I had to confirm with Jamie. I was like, Jamie, don't use that toilet. <laughs> And then we have a full closet here, which this was our cat's Halloween costume. I just have it here to, to demonstrate what could be put here. But, you know, whatever you want, whatever your heart desires, we have a full closet. I'm kind of going all over the place. This is just how my mind works. <laughs> Some people want to know about the custom cushions in the comments. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. They look these awesome. Are, these are real them. basic. So we, we have some other ones on order. Um, but these ones are just super basic. Kels, you want to turn over the top yeah, one? So basically, these are just like, I think it's like a custom, it's like a couch cushion. Like, so it's like scrunched on this yeah. side. And it's just a piece of plywood. And then you just oh, wow. like tie it together. It works great. And yeah, these are just super easy to work with. We did something similar and gutted. I think we used like a stapler. Yeah. These ones are really cool because you can take them off and wash them like super easy. And like nice. you can switch out the covers like. I know some people like get a new couch like with the seasons and it's kind of like the same thing. You can get like a new cover. <laughs> you get like a Christmas edition. I don't know. <laughs> whatever, whatever you're into. <laughs> Sorry um, to interrupt you, Kels. Where were you? I don't even know. I, I, was, I was in the food pantry. Pulling out something. Yeah, what do we got? This is exciting. Food pantry. Nice. And, and then all the, all the slides that I, I always use a push to open one. So you don't have to put latches on any of your slides. Which we learned oh. the hard way when we lived in a, van, a bus. So like we used to latch everything when we would go drive, which was so annoying. Who wants to be latching? Like when you get up to travel, like you don't want to be latching everything. So it's just so nice to have the push to open and you don't have to do anything when you go travel. Um, yeah, great. And then just a, a regular sink, <clears throat> the brushed steel with a nice little faucet. Do you want to talk about this chair over here? You're really proud of this. Yeah, I really, I really like, like this um, switch, the four gang switch. Cool. Um, it's just like a super sleek um, panel. So I, ra I ran all the switches to one place. So these are just lights. We've got three zones of lights in the main area. And then this end one is for the water pump. Um, so you can have cool. that on and off when you're plugged into city. And then this is just for the water heater itself. And then I made sure with this one that we put a light on this because before for our water heater, the electric Bosch one, we just had a switch and you would, it was hard to, to know if it was on or off. You'd have to like look at the Victron app to see if it was drawing power. Nice. Um, but that having the, having the pilot light on the lights on when the thing's on lights off when it's off. So it's dummy proof. And yeah, I think that's what well, we have the bath. Do you want to yeah, we can we show can us have. the back? Yeah, that's the peek juicy in. stuff. Yeah, I yeah. love the nerdy stuff in the back there. <laughs> sure. The juice. Yeah, I'll let Jamie nerd out Come for this. 
You might need a bigger shop. I hope you sell this soon. I know it's so it was so tight getting this in because we have the airstream <laughs> over there as well. Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot going on. Make it work. <laughs> um, so we put plumbing on this side and then electrical all on this side. This is the panel that I always use for electric. Um, I have all my 12 volt stuff on top and then normal 120 breakers down below. But it's all in one panel, so it's all super clean. Um, just makes it real simple and safe and nice and clean. Yep. And then this fan is just constantly on to bring all the, the hot air out, just so it's there's um, the cabinet cool. itself can't get too warm with the, the when the inverter's on and all stuff like that. And then real simple, this panel just slides all the way out. Oh, wow. I love that. So you can get that to is cool. all the electronics. Let me put my light on so you can see a little bit better. <clears throat> and then we've got this we electronic. Got? We've got a 3,000 watt Irfans Victron and then decoder yeah. lithium for the batteries. We went with a 3,000 watt inverter. We've got our charge controller. The standard 30 amp DC DC charger. And then we all know about the Lynx distributor. Yeah, the best love that. way to wire all your components and same kind of the similar concept as the fuse panel. Just everything's in one location. All your fuses keeps your cables all neat. Or you connect. There's no bare connections. No crazy bus bars going on. Everything's housed in this one unit. It's safe. <laughs> That's beautiful. That looks really good, man. Thanks, Damn. man. Um, and then the other side, this panel just pops off, and then all, wow. the, all the pumps and filters are all Water housed in here. here. And that's magnetics, magnetic uh, little catches yeah, there? Yeah, just real cool. simple, real simple, heavy-duty magnetic Dude. catches, and you can just put the panel on. That is beautiful. That is clean and impressive. Yeah, you love it. I like that. <laughs> Makes a lot of sense. We should show them the diesel heater where you where you put it in. Yeah. Really quick. Oh yeah. Because this is really cool. We had this issue in our van where like when we would be getting gas, we'd have to just like put the like fill up the diesel heater inside our van and we were like, this Ugh. is kinda awkward. Sketchy. Yeah. yeah. So for this this time I put the the propane tank and the diesel um the fuel tank for the diesel heater is in this cabinet. I made a propane locker for the propane tank that vents through the floor. And then nice. under this little latch is where you get to your diesel <laughs> fill for your, yeah. Even lit up. Heater. Oh yeah. <laughs> it's lit. You guys are it's freaks. Lit. So then oh this is God. just a, um, it's like a floor. It's meant for uh, a hatch in the floor of a boat. Sure. Um, so su Damn. super simple. and then the cleans up and, and it's right there so you can pull up to your gas station open your sliding door and fill it up done man yeah. that is a really clean and tight conversion i mean i would <laughs> expect nothing less but it's you know it's funny because we spent a lot of time getting to know each other working together and obviously when we were building a bus together um you know we we couldn't do you know we had to we had to take on certain projects and so jamie was like our team carpenter and Kels was like our team finisher. And it's fun to see what you guys do when you do everything because you kill it. It's a beautiful, I mean, that's, that's really clean and thoughtful and you guys really did a nice job making everything accessible and good looking. I can't, even, I I can't even tell you how many times we were like, ah, oh, I wish Ben and Charlie were here. Just yeah. as like the annoying little tasks that you, and like Justin, you guys like, killed all the little detail oriented tasks that no one else wanted to do. You were such like problem solvers. It was yeah. like, we had a problem. And we just knew oh, that figure. We needed, we needed oh. you here for a few little things. A lot yeah. of people would say we might be the best team. I don't know. <laughs> some, some would say that. So we're getting some comments in the chat. Uh, people want to know how can they reach out to you uh, to get a hold of you to buy this, I presume probably, or because they're interested in it. So what's the best way to get a hold of Kels and Jay? Um, our email, right? Yeah, email or DM us on Instagram, we'll eventually get to it. Um, probably email, our email would be the best way. It's uh, kelsandjayhigh at gmail. 
I'll put, it, I'll put it in the chat now as well. well yeah. Jay's gonna and we also, the chat. we do have, um, we're working with an agent and she helps you get financing as well. So if you have trouble getting oh, wow. financing, if you need help with that, she's really, she's amazing. She's, she sold our van and our bus and like really just like walks you through every step and makes the process really easy. So yeah, that's awesome. a, that's a huge advantage because a lot of people, this might be their first experience spending this much money on a single thing. And mm -hmm. I know financing is always a question people have, especially on bus builds and van builds, because it's a lot of money and <clears throat> maybe they don't have all the money. So having an agent yeah. is really amazing. That's a great idea. <clears throat> yeah, we that. learned that with the bus build, that was a huge, a huge problem, like yeah. people getting financed. So we just brought her on and she just, she kills it. Her name's Ashley. Some of you guys might know her. She's in the bus life community as well. So oh, yeah. the high She's drive in bus. The even. Oh, sweet. So I just okay. put our email and the van list in itself in the chat if anyone wants to go check it out. Okay, awesome. And what, what was the platform? I don't think you guys mentioned that. What van is this built in? It's a 2021 Sprinter on a 170 wheelbase, um, the high roof. Oh, yeah, that's kind of important. <laughs> and it's got 4,500 4, miles on it. 4,500, that's pretty much new. And that's a, yeah. is that a diesel Sprinter or a gasoline Sprinter? It's a gas. Gasoline Sprinter. Cool. Yeah. Sweet. Yeah, well, love this thing. <laughs> thank you for being my first, um, I think my first real guest on the show. Oh, yeah. Uh, people, people, people love it. Awesome. <laughs> it's an honor, and it's, always, it's an honor to be friends with you, and Cheers. I miss you. Oh, Can't wait you to guys see are you. awesome. Hopefully, What's see next? you at Palooza or Oh, yeah. Whatever. I'll be at Schooly Palooza for sure. Um, people want to know what's next for Kelson J. What's your next project? Um, we're working on. So we're doing a client build next. So somewhere <laughs> client this build. Ford Transit. Um, and then we're going to get to our Airstream, which is All that's right. going to be a fun project. Yeah, this thing's decked out. This this Transit. It's four by four. Yeah. It's wild. But yeah, it's like a client build. So. It's gonna be a super off-roady adventure, adventure one. Awesome. Well, that is. Uh, <clears throat> I can't wait to see that one. I always tell people <laughs> it's one thing to build rigs and sell them, and there's nothing wrong with that. It's great. But when you have a client that you're building for, that really gets you to do some crazy shit that yeah. you know, <laughs> that you would never do Makes on your own. Yeah. Jay was it's, just like staring at the van today. Like he spent just like the whole day just staring at the van. You guys know how he would get like whenever he'd like build something, he'd just like stare into space for a while and you'd be like, oh, yeah. what's Jay doing? And you'd be like, like <laughs> he, he just, that's all he did today all day. Yeah, that's all I've done. It's processing. <laughs> Download. It. Download, <laughs> yeah. Download. Awesome. Well, thank you, Kels and Jay, for being on live with Chuck. And thanks for the, the uh, premiere of your van tour. And we'll have to do this again once you finish the next project. So yeah, yeah this was a lot of fun. Thanks for having thanks us. For having and thanks, us, Chuck's Chuck. audience. You guys are awesome. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> and when you f and uh, in case y'all don't know, Kels and Jay have their own YouTube channel. It's it's great. They make awesome videos. It's not just building stuff. There there is a deeper interpersonal component to it. So go follow Kels and Jay on YouTube. I tried to link to them in the, in the description. I'm not sure if it turned out or not, but go follow them. They make great videos and obviously they really know how to convert a rig and they don't do just one thing from buses to vans to Airstreams. Um, they're really talented and they're great people. So thanks for being on. We will see you guys next time. Thanks, I'm gonna put you back in the green room. I love you, bye. <laughs> love you too, see ya. Cool, well, how about that, you know? <clears throat> it's another, Another really talented bunch of folks that I'm proud to call my friends. And that van, I got, like, I'm biased, okay, because they're my friends. But I know the things about van conversions that drive me nuts. And some of the things that really bother me are when the things like the power center and the plumbing aren't done well, or they're hard to get to. That just, it grinds a fella's gears, you know. And I really like the interior there. That tile in the shower was awesome. I mean, there's not a lot you can do in a van of that size, but that is more than adequately equipped for one or two people to go adventuring, even maybe full-time live in. 
So if that's something you're interested in, definitely go check it out because I would not only recommend the work they do, but I would stand behind it too. <clears throat> I'm going to check in with my moderators. Not many questions. Someone wanted to know if that van was four-wheel drive, and I don't know, to be honest. They're already gone, but I bet they're still in the chat. And so I bet, uh, Kels and Jay, if you're out there, tell us if it's four-wheel drive or not. <laughs> cool. Well, this is exciting. Um, any, anybody just joining me, welcome to Live with Chuck. This is, I'm trying to take this show serious. That's why I got the live studio audience. And uh, I'm just going to be abusing that for the next couple weeks. I'm sorry. <laughs> but I want to have live guests. Um, I want this to be really fun. I don't know if anybody was like me and grew up listening to like Car Talk with Click and Clack, the Tappet Brothers. But um, I kind of want to make the YouTube version of that related to bus and conversion life. And I've already got next week's guest lined up. It's a really inspiring story. It's my friend named Matt. He was diagnosed with brain cancer. He has six kids and that diagnosis was years ago. And he decided, I met him two years, two years, two years prior. And he decided to, with his, what he thought was limited time remaining, he was like, I'm gonna build out a bus and me and my family are gonna go travel around and make some memories. And they just moved into their rig, I think this week. And, uh, and that guy is kicking his cancer's ass and he's making some sweet memories with his family. And I can't wait to share not only his story, but I think I'm gonna try to talk him into giving a tour of his rig too. And I helped, I didn't help on any of the building cause he lives in California, but I was there to help with the consulting. And I actually met him at a workshop that I was teaching at a tiny house festival, just like weeks before COVID hit. Um, you know, so I haven't had a chance to catch up with him in person, but his story is amazing. He's a really fun guy. And it's just the kind of, you know, it'll, it might make you cry because the stuff that he's doing is really, it's like, what would you do if someone told you that your time on this earth was going to be a lot shorter than you had planned? And the fact that he chose to, you know, build out a bus, fill it with all of his loved ones and hit the road. I think that's a story that not only I want to hear, but I think everybody else watching this is going to be interested in. So make sure you tune in next week. I'll probably take Thanksgiving week off, but um, let's go ahead and get on to the next part of the show, which we'll go ahead and cross this off. We're bigger. At, we're big about punch lists around here. And do you, doesn't that feel good? I don't know if it feels good for the rest of you, but that feels good for me to cross that off the list. Um, Let's talk about the top roof raise considerations. And this is something that's on my mind because if you're just joining us, I was talking about how the bus behind me, if you look at this crack here, we've cut the bus and we are in the process tomorrow. We're going to, we've, we've raised it about an inch and tomorrow we're going to raise it the remaining 11 inches and weld in the hat channels. So I want to talk about if you're considering a roof raise, some pro tips. Um, you're welcome to schedule a consultation with me too. There's a link to do that in the description of the video, but I want to give you a brief overview about what to expect, basic guidelines, and I'm going to segue that seamlessly into the tool du jour of the week, which will be one of my favorite metalworking tools that a lot of people don't know about that's affordable and will help you do things safer, quieter, and cleaner with a lot less frustration. So don't go anywhere. Okay, so say you just purchased a school bus. Congratulations and also my condolences. You're about to spend a whole lot of money and a whole lot of time on a project that you might not finish, let's be honest. Let's assume though that you bought this bus and you're a tall guy like myself, I'm six foot one. Pretty much any bus that I buy that's available out there that's a school bus, if I wanna put in enough insulation in it to make it what I would call a comfortable living space in all four seasons that you would experience in the 48 contiguous states of America. I hope you all voted by the way, whatever side you're on. You want to have a lot of insulation and insulation takes up space and in the vertical plane you or in the vertical dimension you only have so much room and I really like to have at least two inches in the floor and at least three inches in the ceiling and that means for me to hit those numbers a roof raise becomes essential. So Let's talk about initially, how high do you raise the roof? And that's a great question. It's the first question you should ask yourself if you're considering a roof raise. And in my opinion, the quick answer to that is the least amount that you can get by with. 
And the reasons for that are the higher you go, you're going to have clearance restrictions that you'll be facing, but also the vehicle dynamics of the bus will change drastically as you raise the roof, especially if you're going to be adding solar panels or a roof deck or whatever, you're raising the center of gravity of the bus. So going through corners or if you're driving on like I-80 in the you know, middle of winter and you get a big strong gust of wind, these are the things that are really going to change the way the bus handles in those conditions. And those to me are directly related to the wheelbase of the bus. In short, the longer the bus, the higher you can raise it and have the consequences of raising that center of gravity be canceled out by the stability of a longer wheelbase. Um, if you follow along, uh, regretless, you know, she had a roof raise done on her short bus and I think that was an eight inch roof raise. Do you remember Ben? I think it wasn't 12. I think it was eight. So that was a five window short bus, eight inch roof raise. I wouldn't go any higher, but that gave her the space that she needed on my own bus, which is a seven window bus. Uh, I only went 12 inches. Uh, the bus behind me is a 12 inch raise the bus to my left, your right, no, probably your left, no, you're right, is a 16 inch raise and that's a 40 foot bus. In general, I don't recommend raising more than 16 or 18 inches, even though on the bus I used to live in for five years, I raised it 20 inches. I just didn't know better. And while it wasn't a problem for me while I lived in that bus, because I ended up not traveling much since I started a business and it's kind of like having kids. I was stuck here most of the time. Um, those extra four inches, it's really an aesthetic um, addition. You know, you're not going to be, <clears throat> unless you're extremely tall, those four inches aren't going to be make or break for you. They, they just change the way the bus feels. So for everybody, and pretty much I think since my bus, I don't think, with the exception of one person who had a very short roof bus who talked us into a 20 inch raise, I don't think we've ever done more than 16. I'm looking at Ben. I don't think we have. Do you remember? Yeah. <clears throat> and I wouldn't recommend it really. 16 is going to be enough. Really, you're going to pay the penalty in fuel economy, handling stability, and in the way that side winds affect you, especially if you're passing semis on blustery days. I mean, I just took my bus to Kansas City for the taping of gutted and Ben was trailing us. And I mean, he could see, you know, very clearly how when I would pass a semi and it was like windy the whole way out there, I would pass a semi and I was getting tossed around because essentially the side of your bus becomes a sail. So go raise your bus the least amount that you can to be happy. The next thing I want to talk about is the type of raise you do. Some people want the slope transition in the front and some people want to take the raise all the way to the front. I'm partial to raising the bus all the way to the front, which is what we're doing here. That's why we cut it up there. But some people like the slope transition. I want to dispel a myth that the shape of your roof raise has anything to do with aerodynamics because it doesn't. It's we're talking about cross sectional area of your bus and that's not going to change. If you wanted to improve the aerodynamics of your rig, a bus is probably not the place to start. And the best thing you can do is just keep your speeds low. I mean, the difference, in energy required to um, travel at a certain speed is exponential based on the velocity that you're traveling. So it's easy to understand how the difference between 55 miles an hour and say 65 miles an hour might be 20% or 25% of your fuel economy right there to go those extra 10 miles an hour. So if you want to have better fuel economy, just drive slower. There's really no other way around it if you're driving a bus. So. Let's just take that out of the equation. So you're com committed to doing a roof raise. You've decided that you don't want to go too high. Now it's time to buy the materials. The materials that I'm going to recommend right now are the ones that we think are the best after the many raises that we've done. We've done things the hard way, the easy way, and the best way. And this is what I'm going to tell you. We've determined to be the best way. The first thing I can't recommend enough are to get your hat channels from schoolie.com. And schoolie.com, Luke and his team have taken the time to map out the dimensions of the hat channel specifications of every major school bus manufacturer from Bluebird to Thomas to Amtran and everything in between. They can get you the hat channels that will match what you have, which will make installation of your hat channel extensions super easy. The other thing that's cool that they do is they weld in, they, they go ahead and uh, tack weld in, if you can see these little U-shaped inserts right here. 
and that lets you just pop those into your hat channels. They index this perfectly. It also means that when you butt weld this seam here, you end up with a joint that is as strong, if not stronger than the metal around it or as it was originally. And I don't know if Luke's done this, but he was talking about doing a test because so many people, you know, they get skeptical about the strength of those welds to even stagger their cuts, which is really not necessary. Um, he was talking about doing a test where he like drives a truck over these to prove that they're just as strong, but schoolie.com, they make it easy. You pick your length, you select your bus type, they ship them to you and they're ready to be installed. And that is the way to go. Once you have your bus raised and they also sell lifting jacks too. Once you have it raised, you got your new hat channels from schoolie.com welded in. It's time to skin the bus and one big regret that I had on my bus when I did the roof raise, and that was the first roof raise that I did, is that the metal fabricator I was working with talked me into using mild steel. And mild steel is just regular steel, and it will rust, and it will rust very quickly in typical environmental conditions that you'll have if your bus is outside. The bus gets cold at night, in the morning there is dew or frost, and that moisture creates rust, and basically my bus with its new roof raise started rusting the day it was finished. And that is a bummer. And I wish I had known at the time that stock school buses are actually made from galvanized steel and not just mild steel. Galvanized steel is the same mild sheet that you would get. It's then galvanized and then it is put through a heat treating process called annealing. Hence the name galvanized. So you pick up all of the corrosion inhibiting properties of galvanization with the benefit of annealing. And what the annealing does is it kind of opens up the molecular structure of the galvanizing so that paint or whatever coatings you're going to apply next will adhere to it without you having to etch it. And etching is a word for essentially abrading or grooving the surface or scuffing the surface so that your new paint or whatever you're applying, maybe an epoxy primer, which I would recommend, can stick. Well, this saves you that step. The other thing that's cool about the annealing process is it makes the sheets easier to work with if you have to bend them. And as you can tell, you know, working around the corner of this or on the back, we're going to have to put a curve in those sheets. And if you've ever worked with just straight galvanized steel, it's a lot harder to bend. Um, I recommend the galvanized steel and people are always asking me, Chuck, where can I find this? It's not like Walmart or Amazon carry this stuff. You're going to need to look up a metal supplier in your town, ask them about galvanized. Sometimes it's called paint lock is a good trade name for it. 18 gauge is what I like the most. 16 gauge also works. It's quite a bit heavier and more expensive in my opinion, not necessary. And talk to somebody who knows and hopefully they can point you in the right direction. And a lot of times companies will not only be able to supply you with that, but they'll cut it to shape for you too. I definitely recommend that. It saves you a lot of time and headache, even though it does cost a bit more. You get perfectly straight cuts and you can just go to town. Raising the roof is enough work as it is. If you have the option to buy your way out of some of that work cheaply and get higher quality results, you should do it. So just to recap, don't raise too high. Use the schoolie.com hat channels and use galvanized steel for your skins. Now, the next thing you're gonna have to do is rivet those skins on when it's time to install them. There are a lot of differing opinions about, you know, what kind of rivets to use. And some people swear by the bucked rivets that you have to have someone on the inside. I mean, they're insane. It's like old school technology. That's cool. Um, but I really prefer pop rivets. And the best rivets that you can use, best bang for your buck, in my opinion, are made by a company called Avdel. And they are called Avdel Interlock rivets and they are quarter inch structural rivets. They come in different grip ranges. Um, I think it's like SSPI-06 or something like that is the best size for your roof raise. Schoolie.com sells them. So if you're overwhelmed by the numbers and things I just put out there, buy them when you buy your hat channel extensions from schoolie.com. And while you're at it, go ahead and pick up a pneumatic rivet gun. You should have an air compressor. If you don't, buy an air compressor and then get a pneumatic rivet gun. And this is what you use to set those rivets. A typical full-size bus will take somewhere around 1,200 rivets to set, and you don't want to do that by hand. 
If you're doing a quarter inch rivet, I recommend not buying a quarter inch drill bit. Go up 1 64th inch in the drill bit size. Go to a 17 64th inch drill bit. You can get cobalt drill bits for really cheap on Amazon. It's like 20 bucks for a 10 pack. And you use that for drilling your holes, pop your rivets in there, shoot those structural closed back rivets that you get from either Blind Rivet Supply or from Luke at schoolie.com, and you're gonna be on your way. When you have lap joints at the seams, if you want, you can use sealant there. I don't because I go back and I'll be applying seam sealer and hitting it with an epoxy based primer, but you do you. A lot of people hit up me with comments on my videos asking, what do you do for sealant between the sheets on your roof rays? And I just don't worry about it because if you're gonna be painting it and applying seam sealer afterwards, in my opinion, I think you're good to go. And I hate drilling through that goopy mess that sealants leave behind. My last tip on roof raises, and again, this is just an overview. If you have more questions, you can watch my video series about the roof raise I did on my bus, or you can call Luke. Sorry, Luke, <laughs> sending people to you and he'll answer questions. But the last pro tip I have for you, you will have to cut the sheet steel, whatever you buy, either mild steel, galvanized, or my favorite, galvanized. You will have to cut it. And if you're new to the channel, you know that I do everything I can to avoid the use of abrasives. I don't like the sparks they make. I don't like the heat they make. I don't like the dust they make. And I don't like how dangerous they are. So one of my favorite ways to cut sheet steel are with a set of these Chicago Electric, and yes, that is the Harbor Freight home brand, metal cutting shears. Before the recession, pandemic, climate change, Biden administration, whatever you want to call it, these are like 30 bucks. I think now they're 40, and I'm fine with that because it, they're worth every freaking penny. And if you look, it's got these three teeth, and those teeth go back and forth just like the mouth, the bill of a beak and they cut your sheet steel up to, I think these are rated to 14 gauge. They don't make sparks, they make hardly any noise, and they give you a clean cut. And if you buy the extended replacement warranty plan from Harbor Freight, you can swap those out every 90 days and always have a fresh set of jaws, which is the way to go. They sell replacement jaws. The replacement jaws cost almost as much as the tool. So just buy the tool, get the warranty plan, maybe buy two of them, I don't know. We always have like three of these things around because they're so cheap and for what they do, they'll pay for themselves just in the money saved on cutoff wheels. So pick up a pair of those shears and well, it goes without saying, that was my tool du jour of the week. The Chicago Electric Harbor Freight Home Brand Swivel Head Shear. They should be paying me for this, don't you think? They're not. Let's see, I think Ben's saying we have some questions coming in and that's great timing because we're just into the third half of the show. Jim Ross, 30 bucks. Jim Ross, oh, we got some super chats. Holy smokes. I forgot that people could pay me for this. Jim Ross, the eternal, the grandfather, the godfather, the almighty maestro of super chats. Thank you for 30 bucks. Nathan Beckfield, 20. Nathan Beckfield hit me up with 20. Wow, that is... That is nice. It feels good. <laughs> Thank you so much, y'all. What? Can you rephrase a coach bus? Yes, you can. I've seen it done. But kind of the whole point of buying a coach bus, they usually have a seven foot ceiling. Um, so they're, the difference in construction is that they're tubular steel. They almost always have a fiberglass front and back cap or end caps, and that complicates things. Um, but yeah, it can be done. A lot of people have done it. I've never done it. I know with our shop, I would have turned down any job like that because coach buses are amazing machines, and they are superior to a school bus in every possible way. But they are also a lot more complicated. They're better built. And in general, they have more structure. So a roof raise job on a coach bus is gonna be a lot more involved. Um, but yeah, quick side note, when I got started in buses, my start was with coach buses. And I used to make fun of school buses. And I still do. I mean, they're tractors. They're essentially dump trucks and tractors meant for hauling around kids. Coach buses are like jet liners, but with wheels on them. They're built of generally stainless steel and aluminum, stuff that doesn't rust. And they're truly meant for one to three million miles of usage. I know 
the MCI MC8, which was the first bus I had. It was a 1976. The one that we had, it had already served a million miles for Greyhound, and then it was sold to a high school uh, district in Wyoming where it put on another 300,000 miles as an activity bus before we got our hands on it and really treated it awfully. And that thing just kept on ticking, and it's still around to this day, and one day I'll do a video series on reviving that bus. It's at my friend's property down in Colorado Springs. And the model that came after that, the MC9, that was designed for 3 million miles. 30 years of continuous service by Greyhound. It was designed in collaboration with Greyhound. It's all stainless steel and aluminum. Unbelievable machines. I mean, it would eat motors for breakfast. You know, 3 million miles is probably six motors it would go through. But the bus itself, really tough. I've owned three of those. They're unbelievable. So, yeah, I'm a coach guy. Oops, spilling my drink. I'm a coach guy, but I got stuck with buses that are school buses and they're fine. Easier to work on, not as nice. I guess, our, I think we're going into the Q&A, aren't we? Seam, that was a seamless, do you feel how seam, you probably don't feel it because it's been so seamless. But we're seamlessly transitioning now out of the tool du jour of the week into the Q&A of the week. What do we got next? Welding on galvanized, don't do it. Grind off the galvanizing coating. Galvanizing is zinc. And if you hit zinc with the high temps of welding, it, it burns. It burns and it flashes off and that will create porosity in your weld. It's also bad to breathe in. So you want to avoid it at all costs. When we do it here, we grind off the galvanizing, which is best practice at all times. And you want to make sure you have adequate ventilation. Um, before you do something like that. So good question, something that comes up a lot. Questions are coming in quick, I hear. Can you do tempered glass residential windows in a schoolie? The answer is yes. You're going to come into problems with how you interface them into the school bus design. Generally speaking, new construction windows have a thing called a flange. I think it's even called like a construction flange or, some, flange or something. New construction flange, flange on the windows. That flange will want to sit on the outside of your school bus and that's fine, it's just gonna look ugly. So you're gonna to want to trim it out or some way. If you do remodel windows, those don't come with the flange installed. Those want to sit into a cavity and you're gonna to have to figure out a way to seal them. That is a good way to get you know high quality windows into your bus. Just keep in mind that those windows weren't designed to go on the road. Um, so any warranty is going to be void. However, if you're doing like vinyl framed windows, dual pane, tempered glass, they're probably going to hold up just fine. But the, the real issue is going to be making them interface seamlessly with the aesthetic of your bus. That's a great question. Thank you for asking it. Ben? Condensation if foam didn't cover all your steel. If foam doesn't cover all of your steel, what are the issues you face with, face with condensation? That's a good question. Um, that's why I always recommend if you have this space to foam over your hat channels. I see a lot of folks, well-intentioned folks, they're excited to be using spray foam and they use spray foam only to come out flush with the metal of their ribs. So that inside face of their metal rib is still exposed. And if you do that, and I understand you might, and I'm not here to tear you out for it, but, um, just know that the thermal bridging of that rib is going to really degrade the overall efficiency of your window or, or of your ceiling or wall system, even though you put in such high quality insulation. In fact, the nicer, the higher performing insulation you put in the cavity, the more the thermal bridging, because it's a ratio thing, is going to degrade the effectiveness of your total wall system. If you're putting just regular old fiberglass in there that has an R value at one and a half inches of around five versus spray foam, which is gonna be 10, that means that the little rib that you have exposed with its perfect thermal bridging, it's going to have almost double the effect and ability to reduce the overall R value performance of your wall or ceiling system. So that being said, you've got bare steel exposed because you didn't have enough headroom or whatever and you, you couldn't cover it. The best thing I can suggest for you in that situation is you probably should still use a vapor barrier. 
Um, one of the biggest advantages to using spray foam is that it can function as a vapor barrier, but only if you get it on thick enough in enough locations to prevent bare steel or other surfaces where water and moisture in the air inside your bus can condense onto and create moisture and introduce moisture into your wall cavity. So you probably still should use a, a vapor barrier and not just any vapor barrier, you should use what's called like an intelligent vapor barrier or a one-way vapor barrier. The idea of these new vapor barriers are that they keep moisture that gets into, they keep moisture from getting into your walls and any moisture that does get into your walls, they let that moisture evaporate. So they let moisture out, but not in. And here's a funny little omission. So Havelock Wool, they claim that it manages moisture perfectly. You don't have to worry about any of that shit. But if you dig into their website and scroll all the way to the bottom, you'll see a little line that says vapor barrier. Click on that. And that's where they talk about the fact that if you use Havelock wool, you actually damn well better use a vapor barrier and not just any vapor barrier, but an intelligent or a smart vapor barrier, like I just suggested, that performs like a one-way valve. And they even give product recommendations. Isn't that funny? Wouldn't you think a company that claims that their product is capable of managing all of the moisture issues you might have deep inside your wall cavity also says you should still use a vapor barrier? It's just one example of the bullshit that I think Havelock is up to, and that's why they've blocked me from commenting on any of their social media posts across all platforms, because I ask these questions, and they can't handle them, and they shut me down. And I'm all about democracy, open dialogue, let's get the ideas out there and see, see the best man standing, or woman, or whatever. They can't even engage in that conversation because their entire marketing campaign is based on deceiving people. And... I don't stand for that shit. I like truth in advertising. So, end in my soapbox. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Chuck, what do you think of spray foam on the underside of the floor? Okay, the question is, what do I, speaking of insulation and spray foam, what do I think, coming from Matt, thank you, Matt, great to have you here. Um, what, do, what do I think of spray foam on the underside of the floor? And this is a, this is a question I get asked a lot because look, you wanna have all the insulation you can. And well, what if I could just spray the spray foam underneath my bus and that would count for my flooring insulation? And it's, that's a creative approach and I appreciate that type of thinking. It will work for sure, but there will be drawbacks and there will be things that reduce the effectiveness of that approach. In addition to some unintended consequences that also come about and it's going to be expensive so let's dive into that so the first thing that's going to happen if you want to apply spray foam underneath your bus you got to make sure that you clean the underside of your bus cleaner than anything you've ever seen before because you want almost perfect adhesion to the underside of your bus anywhere that the foam doesn't adhere becomes a place where moisture can get in and then get trapped against the steel of your bus frame or your bus floor and anywhere we have moisture trapped against steel, we know that's gonna create rust. And rust is what will kill your bus conversion first. So that's one consideration. It's also going to be expensive. You can insulate the entire subfloor of a bus on top of the floor pan using XPS foam. That stuff is about two bucks a square foot for two inches of thickness. If you're gonna be hiring that out, I don't even know what a spray foam contractor would charge to insulate the underside of a bus, but you damn well better believe it's gonna be more than to insulate the inside of a house because that is a nasty job. They're gonna be rolling around underneath a bus getting spray foam dripped upon them all day long. So it's gonna be more expensive. The other thing that you run the risk of happening is having things get spray foamed over that a mechanic might down the, down the line need access to. You also have to keep in mind you have things like frame rails, transmissions, um, potentially exhaust pipes, drive shaft, things that might prohibit easy access for the company or person spraying the foam to be able to get the foam everywhere. And again, going back to the thermal bridging I was talking about, that metal floor pan that you have inside your bus is connected to all of the other metal in your bus, including the exterior walls. So if you're in a cold environment, that cold from the outside is going to draw the heat from inside your bus through the metal floor pan to the outside world, whether or not the underside is insulated. Now, all that said, it's still going to do something. And one of the things it's going to do is prevent what I would call the, like the drafty effect of the air circulating under your bus, drawing heat away from your floor. That's not gonna happen because that air is obviously not gonna be able to touch the metal underside on the underside of your floor. So that's great. Um, the other thing that you're gonna get 
is that you're also going to retain the headroom that you started with and that's really nice but at the end of the day i would be very curious to know what the effective r value per inch of spraying the underside of your floor pan is compared to just going with a more conventional foam board based insulation and i think if you did a, a cost comparison and then a real net r value comparison you might reconsider you just might but in general it's something i don't recommend but if you've got the money and you're willing to take a risk and you've got a very clean, non-rusty bus, excuse me, I think it's something you can consider, but under no circumstances is it my top pick or do I actually recommend it? So there we go. Next question. How does chassis saver handle salt and snow? Like two minutes. How does chassis saver handle salt and snow? Less. Two minutes or less. I got like, okay. Chassis saver is great. Um, it does handle salt and snow. The biggest drawback to chassis saver is that it breaks down with exposure to UV light. So if you're using chassis saver anywhere sunlight can directly shine upon it, you should top coat it with something else first. It's all about metal preparation. You want to make sure that you scrape off any flaky rust. Next question. Uh, how do you keep water from getting behind the flasher cover plates? How do you keep water from getting behind the flasher cover plates? And I'm guessing you're talking about like the flasher deletes we would install. Check out the video. I already answered that question, but I like to use the sealant du jour, which in that case was a GeoCell ProFlex. You could also use SikaFlex 221, Dicor Lap, sealant, or butyl rubber. Next. Uh, source for wire diagrams on buses. Source for wire diagrams on buses. I'm assuming you're talking about factory wire diagrams that would be coming from Bluebird or Thomas. Reach out to your local Bluebird dealer and bother them. If you want for Thomas, reach out to Thomas. That's where I would go. Matt. Best insulated windows, the most expensive ones you can afford. I would recommend a company called Peninsula Glass. They're going to make the best custom shaped windows. Dual pane is definitely the way to go. Dual pane does have drawbacks though. If you're going to be changing elevations all the time, there's a chance the gasket between the two panes can blow out and that will allow the ingress of atmospheric air into the window sills or in between the window panes. And that atmospheric air does contain moisture. It will condense on the panes and you'll get foggy windows that you'll never be able to fix unless you replace them. How do you how do you improve top speed of a 545 transmission? Get rid of it. That's how you improve the top speed of an AT545. Now you can add a transmission cooler. The more viscous that you can keep your transmission fluid, the less slippage you'll have going through the torque converter. So you could always add a transmission cooler. I would recommend switching over to synthetic fluid yesterday because that's going to hold up the best over the extreme temperatures that that transmission is going to generate. But let's be realistic. If you really want to get a better top speed, you're going to have to either change out the rear end gears on your rear differential or swap to a transmission that doesn't have a slipping torque converter. There's just no way around it. I'm doing that myself, so I feel your pain. Matt? Hank Iring donates $19.99. Hank? Yeah. Hank, thanks for $19.99. You know, that's the price of a book at Barnes & Noble. Maybe I'll go buy one. Um, uh, what do we got next? Ben? Uh, Dickinson heaters, yes or no? Dickinson heaters, yes or no? Yes. Or no, it depends on what you want. The cool thing about Dickinson heater, and for those of you who don't know, I actually happen to have one right here. Dickinson is a company that is from the marine world and they make, <laughs> they make these beautiful stainless steel diesel and propane fired fireplaces that are meant to be mounted inside of a sailboat. And they are cool. What I like about them is they give you the ambiance of a wood stove without the insurance hassles and clearance requirements. And they're self-stoking, obviously, because you're not putting logs of diesel into them. You plumb them into the diesel tank of your bus using an extra pump, or you can install an auxiliary diesel tank. So they're very cool. However, I will not be installing one in my bus, even though I have one because I don't have the space to give up to something that I don't use that regularly and I would rather have a diesel heater that's hidden. There's no doubt, okay, that the vibe is better, the look is better, but sometimes we don't have the space for the vibe and the look. Panels hanging off over the side of your bus. Solar panels hanging over the side of your bus. Sometimes you gotta do it. Never hang them wider though than your bus is. You know, if your bus is 96 inches wide, which all but a few coaches are, don't buy a panel that's like 110 inches wide. Um, the bus behind me, you can kind of see like right up here, those panels are hanging off. Well, they don't hang over the side of the bus. They're probably still maybe 10 inches shy of hanging off the side of the bus, but you definitely want the biggest panels you can fit, no doubt. Um, this guy is looking at an International with a 466 with an Allison 3080. Any way to 
convert the transmission to all mechanical to match the engine? Okay, guy, this is a great question. So the question is, there's a gentleman out there, he's looking at a bus with an international DT-466 that I'm assuming is an all mechanical engine, just like the one in my bus, but it's paired to an Allison, he says MD-3080, I think he meant to say MD-3060, which is a computer controlled five speed automatic that can be unlocked to a six speed un un uh, transmission. And he's asking, is there an easy way to convert it to an all mechanical transmission to match his all mechanical engine? And the answer is yes. And I would suggest an Allison MT-643 for a four speed automatic. You're gonna lose overdrive, keep in mind. So you probably will have to change your rear end gear ratio if you want to maintain highway cruising speeds. Or you can go to an Allison MT-653 and that extra gear, it's not an overdrive, it's actually a granny gear at coming in lower than first gear. But if you swap to that, you can really go low ratio on your rear end to get those highway speeds. And by shifting into first, it will give you that acceleration off the line so you're not paying all of the costs of really biasing your drivetrain for highway speeds. The downside to the 653 is that first gear is only available if you manually select it. Otherwise, it will automatically start in second gear and you'll be slow off the line, but it's probably gonna be fine unless you're trying to drag race somebody. There are other Allisons out there. There are older ones that are six speed and stuff, but they're so old that finding parts and stuff are gonna be very hard for you. So I would suggest sticking with the MT653 or 43 series. Um, the HT740s and 750s are gonna to be too heavy duty for your needs. Ben. Uh, any tips for long-term safety around propane? Tips for long-term safety around propane, yeah. If you can, mount your propane tanks outside. Also avoid, wherever possible, um, fittings, couplers, and unions inside your living space. Install a propane or explosive gas detector in your living space. Use um, inside of your living space. I definitely recommend not using any of the rubber lines, especially for connecting to a stove, because they'll get too hot and you run the risk of potentially melting the rubber. So use, we like to use, you can get them at Home Depot, the corrugated stainless steel lines for connecting to appliances. Um, in general, propane is pretty easy to do safe because a lot of people don't know the line pressures in propane after the regulator are half a PSI. And making a connection leak tight at half a PSI is pretty easy to do. Um, a lot of people will be afraid of propane, and rightfully so, and opt to do a lot of electric appliances. But if you're going electric, just remember, electrical fires are the number one cause of fires in RVs. People become complacent because electricity doesn't explode, but electricity does smolder, it generates heat. And if you watched my video where Ben and I fixed the most dangerous electrical system we've ever seen, that was a disaster waiting, for, waiting to happen and it wasn't going to be an explosion. It was just going to slowly erupt into flames one day. And we even found evidence where some loose connections were causing the wood underneath the fuse holders to become charred. And the owners had no idea that things were that bad, so. Mark Anderson, $20. Thank you, Mark Anderson, for 20 bucks. You're one of our Schooly Support members. It's been awesome talking to this guy. He knows his shit. You, you honestly don't need my help, but I'm flattered that you pay me for it. <laughs> solar generators full-time Oh, solar generators full-time in a bus. I'm glad you asked that question. The short answer is maybe. Um, but I want you to know that I've got a video series planned coming up um, at the end of this year and beginning of next year where I'm going to dive into that. If you don't know, um, me and Ben and our company have really made most of our money recently doing off-grid solar electric installs and designs and consultations. We've, you know, over the last eight years kind of accidentally become experts in this field. And at the same time as all of those batteries and solar panels and equipment are becoming better for those component-based systems where you buy everything separately and then wire it all up. Um, they've been making lots of strides in all-in-one systems. And so I'm actually going to be taking a couple of off-the-shelf all-in-one systems and not only introducing you to them, but describing how I might incorporate them into a build and point out some advantages that they have that a lot of people don't consider when they're designing their bus electrical systems. And it might work for you, it might not, but I, it's definitely something that we need to talk about and I'm excited to share that with you. So that's a great question, but it's gonna take me literally multiple videos to address. So let's do three more questions and then I think we're gonna wrap it up for this one. From an insulation point of view, the difference between double or single pane windows. 
I was just talking with someone today and you'll, it depends on who you talk to. It depends on the glass being used. And if there's a, like a xenon or argon filled gasp in the, between the panes, but the difference between double and single pane, um, it's not much in terms of our values numerically, you know, a single pane window might be 0.8 to one for their R value. Whereas a double pane window might be like a 0.14 to a 0.18 or sorry, a 1.4 to a 1.8. So it's not even going to be quite double. Um, and that's, you know, whatever. But when we're talking about doubling the R value, even though it's a low number, we're still doubling the R value. In my opinion, the biggest gains are not necessarily from just the R values alone. You're going to get additional sound deadening, which is nice if you're going to be parking places. Maybe you have to sleep at a truck stop. The guy's idling his truck all day. It's going to be a bummer. So that's a big advantage. And the other big advantage is you're going to be a lot less likely to get condensation on the inside of your windows, especially if you do a lot of cold weather camping. And anytime you get condensation on the inside of your windows, that condensation is going to obviously defrost and melt out. And one of the bummers, a lot of people, even professional bus builders out there, they will keep the stock school bus windows. They'll think, well, we'll take them out, we'll clean them, we'll reseal them, we'll do all this, and that's great. And even if you can stop 100% of the water ingress from the outside world getting into your bus, there is one crucial distinction between stock bus windows and RV windows that to me means that no matter how good you do, even if you can permanently seal those windows, which in my opinion, I don't think you can, they make them totally the wrong choice for a full-time liveaboard bus, and that is, they will, without a doubt, get condensation on the inside of them if you are ever camping in your bus, living in your bus, somewhere cold. It's a guarantee. Just the, the moisture in your breath, if you ever take a shower, if you ever cook a soup, you're going to get condensation inside your windows. And stock school bus windows do not, listen to me carefully on this, they do not have a way for that condensation to drain to the outside. That condensation, the moisture, it could be frozen, it could be liquid, it will just drain and drip off the back of those windows down into the walls and not outside the bus. If you look at RV windows, they all have drain holes in the bottom of the windows. And those drain holes make it so that any condensation that builds up on the inside will go down into the track of the window and out to the outside of the bus. And that is why I will never and would never recommend keeping the stock school bus windows, nor would I personally live in a bus that had stock school bus windows because you are guaranteed to get moisture in your walls if you do any amount of full-time living in your bus in cold environments. So anybody keeping their stock windows, I think they just haven't lived in their bus full-time in cold environments and had the opportunity to see the amount of condensation that drains into their walls. And we all know Wet walls will create mold and mildew and exactly the kind of harmful side effects that I think a lot of us want to avoid living a conscientious lifestyle. Am I right? So there we go. What do you use for solar panel rails? For solar panel rails, we are currently using Iron Ridge XR1000 rails and that is their heaviest duty, most reinforced rail. It is rated to hurricane strength winds at four foot spacing on the L brackets and we're at like two, two and a half foot spacing on our brackets. And by hur hurricane force winds, I mean 150 plus miles an hour sustained winds. We have a bus in Puerto Rico that just easily weathered that big hurricane they had about four weeks ago. They were the only people in the area that had power. So I got time for one more question and we're gonna call it. Thank you everybody for being here and being an active participant. I think I'm almost about to set a record, almost 200 people watching this live stream. We might've hit 200. Yep. So, and I know there's a bajillion questions, but the truth of the matter is I can't answer them all. If you want to schedule one-on-one -on -one hourly consulting, there's a link to it in the video description. I would love to talk to you and answer your questions. But uh, as you know, our time is limited and brief on this planet. And so is it in this live chat. So last question, Ben. Gray water, inside or outside? Gray water inside or outside the bus? Pertinent question as temperatures get colder. We here at the shop always put the gray water outside the bus. And lately we've started installing heat pads underneath the gray water tank. The nice thing is 
Your gray water could be frozen, but since the water comes in at the top, you'll always be able to fill it up. But it's really handy to have a heat pad when you want to drain it. So I definitely recommend installing a holding tank heating pad. You can get them in 12 volt and 120 volt flavors available on Amazon. They're pretty cheap and it's an easy way to get that job done. But I definitely like keeping the gray tanks outside under the bus where you can let gravity run the show of getting the water to the tank. Some people in the marine world they're familiar with like macerator pumps and things like that and those do work but they're maintenance intensive they can fail and cause really nasty problems we've had to fix buses i mean really one of the grossest jobs i ever did was fixing this gorgeous bus that had a really disgusting shower drain setup because it had to pump the gray water up into a different tank so keep your gray water where it belongs underneath you so with that, I think I can cross off a few more things. Look at this, tool du jour and the Q&A. Nathan Beckfield for $10 says, what, kind of, what are you drinking? Nathan Beckfield for 10 bucks with the pertinent question, I'm drinking a cut water pineapple margarita or what's left because I dropped it and spilled it on my foot. So thank you everybody for tuning into this live with Chuck. It means a lot to me to have you here. Um, Thanks to Kelsey and Jay for being on the show. Again, hit them up if you're interested in their van conversion. And even if you're not, you should follow them because they're a great group of people building awesome rigs to the highest standards. And their videos are not just about the builds they do. It's about life. Life is a builder. Life is a human. And they deserve your follow. So check out them. And we will see you next week where we have a special guest again on Live with Chuck. We'll be answering your questions. Who knows what I'm going to talk about? The tool du jour is definitely going to be one you don't want to miss. And we'll catch you then. In the meantime, we'll see you Sunday for my next live or for my next video premiere. You don't want to miss that one. Day in the life of Chuck Cassidy here at the shop. Huh? Sounds like fun. Thanks for tuning in, everybody. And we will see you next time as I click the finish button. Thank you.